Hi, welcome to First Chapter Fridays with Northfield Public Library. Today's book is Restart by Gordon Corman. It's a 2021 Maude Hart Lovelace nominee in both divisions one and two. Close your eyes, get comfortable, and get ready to listen to the first two chapters of Restart. Chapter one, Chase Ambrose. I remember falling, at least I think I do. Or maybe that's just because I know I fell. The grass is far away until it isn't anymore. Somebody screams, wait, it's me. I brace for impact, but it never comes. Instead, everything just stops. The sun goes out, the world around me disappears. I'm being shut down like a machine. Does this mean I'm dead? Blank. The light is harsh, fluorescent, painful. I squeeze my eyes shut, but I can't keep it out. It's an explosion. Voices are babbling all around me. You can't mistake the excitement. He's awake! Get the doctor! They said he'd never... Oh, Chase! Doctor! I try to make out who's there, but the light is killing me. I thrash around, blinking wildly. Everything hurts, especially my neck and left shoulder. Blurry images come into focus. People, standing and sitting in chairs. I'm lying down, a sheet over me, white, which makes the brightness even worse. I raise my hands to cover my face, and suddenly I'm tangled in wires and tubing. A clip on my finger is tethered to a beeping machine next to my bed. An IV bag hangs from a pole above it. Thank God! The lady beside me is choked with emotion. I can see her better now. Long brown hair, dark-rimmed glasses. When we found you lying there... That's all she can manage before she breaks down crying. A much younger guy puts an arm around her. A white-coated doctor bursts into the room. Welcome back, Chase, he exclaims, picking up a chart on a clipboard at the foot of my bed. How do you feel? How do I feel? Like I've been punched and kicked over every inch of my body. But that's not the worst part. How am I supposed to feel when nothing makes sense? Where am I? I demand. Why am I in a hospital? Who are these people? The lady with the glasses gasps. Chase, honey, she says in a nervous voice. It's me, Mom. Mom? Doesn't she think I know my own mother? I've never seen you before in my life, I bluster. My mother is... My mother is... And that's when it happens. I reach back for an image of Mom and come up totally empty. Ditto dad, or home, or friends, or school, or anything. It's the craziest feeling. I remember how to remember, but when I actually try to do it, I'm a blank. I'm like a computer with its hard drive wiped clean. You can reboot it, and the operating system works fine, but when you look for a document or file to open, nothing's there. Not even my own name. Am I... Chase? I ask. While my other questions sent murmurs of shock around my hospital bed, this one is greeted with silent resignation. My eyes fall on the chart in the doctor's hands. On the back of the clipboard is written, Ambrose, Chase. Who am I? A mirror, I exclaim. Somebody give me a mirror. Perhaps you're not ready for that, the doctor says in a soothing tone. The last thing I'm in the mood for is to be soothed. A mirror, I snap. The lady who calls herself Mom fumbles inside her pocketbook and hands me a makeup compact. I open it up, blow away the loose powder, and stare at my reflection. A stranger stares back at me. Amnesia. That's what Dr. Cooperman says I have. Acute 
retrograde amnesia, the loss of all memory prior to a certain event, in this case, me taking a swan dive off the roof of our house. I know what amnesia is, I tell him. So how come I remember a random word like that, but I can't remember my own name, or my own family, or why I was climbing on the roof? That I can answer, supplies the younger guy, who turns out to be my older brother Johnny, a college student home for the summer. Your room has that dormer window. You just open it up and crawl out onto the eaves. You've been doing it as long as I can remember. Uh, and did anyone warn me I might break my neck? Only since you were six, my mother puts in. I figured if you survived this long, it was time to stop worrying. You were such an athlete. Her voice trails off. Amnesia can be an unpredictable thing, the doctor informs us, especially with a traumatic injury like this one. We're just starting to understand which parts of the brain control which life functions. But for all we know, it has nothing to do with geography. Some patients lose long-term memory, some lose short-term memory. Others lose the ability to transfer from short to long-term. In your case, the damage seems totally confined to your sense of who you are and what's happened in your life up until this point. Lucky me, I say bitterly. Cooperman raises an eyebrow. Don't knock it. You remember more than you realize. You can walk and talk and swallow and go to the bathroom. How'd you like to have to relearn everything, even how to put one foot in front of the other? The bathroom part is definitely an upgrade. They say I was in a coma for four days before I woke up. I can't say how the bathroom side of things was taken care of during that time, but I'm pretty sure I had nothing to do with it. Maybe I'm better off not knowing. The doctor checks a few readings on my monitor, making notes on my chart, and then regards me intently. Are you absolutely certain you can't remember anything at all from your life before you regained consciousness? Once again, I peer back into the nothingness that's where my memory is supposed to be. It's like reaching into a pocket for something that should be there but isn't. Only that something isn't keys or a phone, it's your whole life. It's bewildering and frustrating and terrifying at the same time. Try harder, I push myself. You didn't just wish into being when you came out of that coma. You're in there somewhere. A vague image starts to form, so I bear down, concentrating with all my might, trying to rec wrestle it into focus. What is it? Johnny asks breathlessly. At last, the details sharpen into view. I see a little girl, maybe four years old, wearing a blue dress with white lace. She seems to be standing in some kind of garden. At least, she's surrounded by greenery. Well, there's this girl, I begin, struggling to keep the picture in my head. Girl? Cooperman turns to my mother. Does Chase have a girlfriend? I don't think so, Mom replies. It isn't like that, I insist. This is a little kid. Helene? My mother asks. The name means nothing to me. Who's Helene? Dad's kid, Johnny supplies. Our half-sister. Dad. Sister. I search for a connection between those words and the memories they should trigger. My mind is a black hole. There might be a lot in there, but it can't get out. Are the two of them close? Cooperman inquires. Mom makes a face. Doctor, after the accident, my ex-husband came to shout and accuse and punch the emergency room wall. Have you seen him here since then, while his own son lay in a coma? That should give you an idea of the relationship between my boys and their father and his new family. I don't know any Helene, I volunteer. But you can't go by me because I don't know anybody. This is just a little blonde girl in a blue dress with white lace kind of dressed up, like maybe she's going to church or something. But why I remember her and nothing else, I can't tell you. Definitely not Helene, Mom concludes. She has dark hair, like her mother. I turn to the doctor. Am I just crazy? Of course not, 
he replies. In fact, this little blonde girl suggests that your memory isn't gone at all. It's only your ability to access it that's been damaged. I believe that your missing life will come back to you, or at least some of it will. This girl might be the key. I want you to keep thinking about her, who she is, and why she's so important that you remember her when everything else has disappeared. I honestly try, but there are too many other things going on. Now that I'm not dead, the hospital is suddenly in a big hurry to get me out of there. Dr. Cooperman runs tests on every part of me except my left earlobe. Turns out my brain may be short-circuited, but the rest of me still works. So how come I ache all over? Muscular is his diagnosis. From the fall. Or should I say, he chuckles at his own joke, the sudden stop at the bottom. Every muscle from nose to toes tenses up from that kind of shock. Tack on 96 hours of complete inactivity, and you stiffen all over. It's normal. It'll pass. My only real injuries are a concussion and a separated left shoulder. Turns out my bad diving form saved my life. My shoulder hit the ground a split second before my head, absorbing just enough of my hard landing to keep the impact from killing me. Mom brings clothes for me to change into. I suppose I shouldn't be so blown away that they fit. They're my clothes, after all. But, of course, they're new to me. I can't help wondering if I have a favorite shirt or a super broken-in pair of jeans. I don't remember the car, either. A Chevy van. Or the house. I take the opportunity to fill in a few blanks about myself. I am not the child of millionaires. I have no great love of cutting the grass. Or maybe that one's on Johnny. I've got an excuse. I've been in a coma. I note the window I must have climbed out of, since it's the only one with roof access. For some reason, I expected it to be higher, and I'm embarrassed. Like it's an insult to my manliness that such a puny fall scrambled my brains. When Mom opens the door, a chorus of voices cry out, Surprise! A makeshift banner hangs across the living room. Welcome home, champ! A heavyset man about Mom's age steps forward, enfolds me in a crushing bear hug, and rubs his knuckles up and down my head. Good to have you back, son. Mom is horrified. Stop it, Frank! He has a concussion! The man, my father... Let's me go, but he's defiant. Ambrose men can take a few licks, Tina. You're talking about an all-county running back. Ex-all-county running back, Dad, Johnny amends. You heard the doctor. Chase can't play football this season. <sighs> Dopey doctor, my father snorts. What does he weigh? 140 soaking wet? He faces Mom. Don't turn him into a wimp like you did with Johnny. Thanks, that means a lot, my brother says dryly. Why are you here, Frank? My mother is quickly losing patience. How many times have I asked you not to use your key anymore? This is not your house, and it hasn't been for a long while. I pay the mortgage on this place, he growls. All at once, the cloud lifts from his face, and he's grinning. Besides, we had to be here to welcome home the conquering hero. Falling off a roof doesn't make me a hero, I mumble. I can't put my finger on it, but there's something about my dad that makes me nervous. It isn't physical. In fact, for a middle-aged guy, he's pretty energetic and spry despite the paunch and the thinning hair. His smile is totally overpowering. To see him is to want to like him. Maybe that's the problem, I decide. He's too confident that he's welcome everywhere. And going by mom? He isn't. Not here, anyway. He's brought his new family, a wife named Corinne, who doesn't look much older than Johnny, and Helene, my four-year-old half-sister. Mom was right. Helene's definitely not the girl in the blue dress. It's no big deal, I guess, but I'm disappointed. I was kind of hoping for one thing in my life to be connected to reality. Although I'm meeting them for the first time, I have to remind myself they already know me. For some reason... They don't seem to like me very much. Corinne hands back, 
and the little kid stays firmly attached to her mom's skirt. They look at me like I'm a time bomb about to go off in their faces. What did I ever do to them? My father seems to be settling in for a long visit, but mom's having none of that. He has to rest, Frank, she says. Doctor's orders. What? He's chopping wood. He's resting. Alone, she insists, in his room, where it's quiet. He sighs. <laughs> Ants at a picnic, that's what you are. He hugs me again, squeezing slightly less this time. Great to have you back, champ. Sorry it couldn't be more of a celebration, but Nurse Killjoy over there. He inclines his head in my mother's direction. I stick up for her a little. She's right about the doctor. He said I have to take it easy because of my concussion. <sighs> concussion, he snorts. When I played football, I got my conk bonked lots of times. You rub a little dirt on it, and you're good. Corinne appears at her husband's elbow. We're so glad you're okay, Chase. Come on, Frank. Let's go. I feel like I have to fill the hostile silence that follows. So I lean down to my kid sister. That's a nice doll you've got there. What's her name? She shrinks back like I'm about to eat her. Eventually, Dad's gone, taking Corinne and Helene with him. Johnny goes out to meet some friends, and Mom orders me upstairs to get a head start on the relaxation that almost caused a civil war. She has to show me which room is mine, because I don't remember any of it. Not the wooden staircase with the faded floral runner at the center. Not the narrow hallway with the low ceiling. Not the wooden door with the crack down the center panel. My mom sees me evaluating the damage and is momentarily surprised by my surprise. Then she tries to explain it away. That's probably my fault. I always let you and your friends play sports in the house. You're too big for that now. Or the house is too small. Which sports? I ask. Tears are coming to her eyes. This is hard for her. Football. Soccer. Badminton. You name it. Being in my room is the weirdest experience of all. It's my room. There's no question about that. The walls are covered with newspaper clippings about football teams I start on and lacrosse games I won. That's me in the pictures, diving into end zones and being mobbed by ecstatic teammates. More unfamiliar faces. There are trophies, too. Shells of them. Chase Ambrose, top scorer. Chase Ambrose, MPV, MVP. Most yards from scrimmage. Team captain. State champions. I'm really somebody. I only wish I knew who. It takes some doing to build up my courage, but I eventually make it over to the window. I was wrong before. It's plenty high. I'm lucky to be alive. It's like I've been parachuted into the middle of someone else's life. Someone who looks exactly like me, yet isn't me. The doctor's right. I need to rest. I sit down on the edge of the bed. My bed. There's a phone on the nightstand. The screen cracked. I wonder if I had it with me when I fell. I press the home button. It's dead. There's a charging cable right beside it, and I plug it in. After a couple of minutes, the display lights up, and there I am again with two other kids. Complete strangers, although you can tell from the pose that the three of us are close friends. It's a selfie with the kid on my right as photographer. I'm in the middle, and the smallest of the three of us, which is surprising since I'm a pretty big guy. It must be Halloween because there are little kids in costume in the background. I'm wielding a baseball bat, holding it high, and hanging off the tip of it is a mangled, ruined jack-o'-lantern. The screen goes dark and I press the button again. The image of the triumphant pumpkin bashers reappears. I can't take my eyes off it. All three of us wear wild, gleeful, unholy, cake-eating grins. What kind of person am I? Chapter 2. Shoshana Weber. Shosh 466. Hey, little bro. Want to smile? J.W. Piano Man. Question mark, question mark, question mark? Shosh 466. 
Alpha Rat took a header off his roof and almost killed himself. J.W. Piano Man. By almost, you mean... Shosh, 466. Sorry, still alive, but supposedly messed up. Just got out of the hospital yesterday. J.W. Piano Man. Any chance Beta and Gamma Rats fell with him? Shosh, 466. Nope, solo performance. Don't get greedy. Smiling yet? J.W. Piano Man. Now who's being greedy? I exit messages and call Joel because I'm worried about him. I always worry about him. He's my younger brother, 14 minutes younger anyway. But if the thought of Chase Ambrose falling off his stupid roof onto his stupid head doesn't bring a smile to Joel's lips, then something's seriously wrong. Besides the usual, I mean. Hey, he answers. Even in that single syllable... I can pick up the discouraged tone in his voice. He's angry and homesick, and who can blame him? It's not like going away to boarding school was his first choice, or even his twentieth. Is Melton getting any better? I ask, almost afraid to hear the answer. That's Melton Prep and Musical Conservatory in New Britain, Connecticut. What can I tell you? It's exile. I don't argue with him. How can I? Joel's a talented musician who belongs in a place like Melton. But that doesn't change the fact that he'd still be at home starting 8th grade at Hiawassee if it weren't for what happened. How are the other kids? Okay, he replies without much enthusiasm. All losers just like me. I'm probably not going to get picked on, if that's what you mean. There are no pickers here, only pickies. That bugs me. You're not losers. You're there because you're winners. You have talent. There's a reason why I can't live in my own town, and it has nothing to do with playing the piano. It's Alpharat, and you know it. If he fell off a skyscraper instead of his own roof, I'd be on my way home right now. I have to let that pass, because it's the bitter truth. Chase Ambrose and his two disgusting friends hounded my poor brother out of town. The thought of it amazes me, even though I saw it happen. I still can't figure it out. Chase isn't Darth Vader or Voldemort. He doesn't have the force or dark magical powers. And yet he, Aaron Hakimian, and Bear Bratsky made Joel's life so miserable that my parents had no choice but to find him a school in another town. We tried to fight it. My dad spent so much time in the principal's office that it would have made sense for him to leave a change of clothes there. But nothing could be done about the bullying. Most of the time, there was no way to prove who was doing it. A random foot tripping Joel up in a crowded hall, or a shoulder rammed into his chest that sent him sprawling. <laughs> Sorry, man, didn't see you. Dog poop pushed in through the vents of his locker, his clothes mysteriously disappearing from the changing room to be replaced by a rabbit suit. When a science project wound up smashed, or a painting ruined in the art room, it was always Joel's. On the night of the talent show, when the fire alarm was pulled, it was during Joel's piano performance. It started with just Chase, Aaron, and Bear. Eventually, though, it spread. The other kids, well, they couldn't help but notice that every time someone was making a fuss or protesting, stuffed into a locker or mummified with toilet paper, it was my brother. Before you knew it, Joel was the school victim and the school joke. His life was practically unbearable. Who do you blame? The principal? Dr. Fitzwallis did what he could, but most of the time there wasn't any evidence. Sure, he could make the occasional try. There was this time Chase chucked a lacrosse stick at Joel's bike, and the butt end got jammed in the spokes. Joel went flying over the handlebars and wound up with a sprained wrist, a black eye, and a nasty scrape along his jaw stretching from chin to ear. There were plenty of witnesses to that one. Dr. Fitzwallis was all set to throw the book at Chase. A long suspension, the works. The school board overruled him. They agreed it was wrong to throw the stick, but insisted that Chase couldn't have predicted it would result in serious injury. Ha! The real reason was that Chase was the town sports hero and the son of the last town sports hero. Chase's dad had a lot of admirers on that board. And my family? 
didn't. The only time anyone was able to pin something on those three idiots, it had less to do with my poor brother than the fact that it cost the district money. At the big open house in May, Joel was invited to play piano. He's by far the best musician around here, even if none of the other kids appreciate it. Anyway, Chase, Aaron, and Bear planted six cherry bombs inside the school's baby grand, timed for the middle of the performance. I can still hear Joel's scream when the big firecrackers went off, splintering the wood of the piano. I think that's part of what makes him such an irresistible target for the chases of the world. They know they can always get a reaction out of him. After that, Joel couldn't even walk down a hall without a bunch of football players making fun of how scared he'd been. We were all scared, but it's only Joel they remember. The irony is that the case against Chase and company had nothing to do with the attack on my brother. Nope. It was the damage to the piano that got the administration upset enough to bring in the police. The juvenile court judge sentenced Chase, Aaron, and Bear to community service at our town senior citizen home, as if the elderly deserved that. You'd think Chase would leave Joel alone after that. It would have made sense. But sense has never been an alpha rat quality. So my parents found a new place for Joel, because as long as that bully was around, my brother would never be safe. Joel's probably right that if Chase had fallen off a skyscraper instead of just a roof, he'd be able to leave Melton and come home. Sometimes I feel like I should be up on that tall building, pushing Chase over the side. But that would make me no better than him. And I am better. Everybody is. The night before the first day of school, my dad always used to take Joel and me to Heaven on Ice, which is one of those self-serve frozen yogurt places. Even though Joel and I are twins, our dessert strategies are totally opposite. I get vanilla yogurt with just a handful of chocolate sprinkles. Joel prefers a thimble full of yogurt and 99% toppings. It's a competition to see who can load up the most weight. I don't want to go this year. Come on, Shosh, my dad wheedles. It's a tradition. All your friends will be there. Not my best friend. He gives me a sad smile. So you and Joel are best friends now? When he's home, you two fight like cats and dogs. He should be home now. I know Dad's trying to help, but I'm determined to be miserable. We've been over this a million times. This is the best thing for Joel. Whatever the reason he's there, he'll learn to love Melton for the music program. In the end, I let him talk me into going. Mom and Dad are worried enough about my brother. I don't need them stressing over me, too. It's weird to be at Heaven on Ice without Joel. I see Hugo and Mauricia, and the first question they ask is how Joel's doing. The way they say it, it's like he's been shipped off to the moon, not Connecticut. I don't want to deal with the whole sob story again, so I change the subject and ask them about camp. They both went to sleep away this summer. Right when Hugo is telling me about his life-and-death struggle with a pup tent, I spot him, the jerk, the worst person in the world. Chase has a few small cuts and bruises on his face, although nothing like what I was hoping for. His left arm is in a sling, but that's about it. He's standing in front of the row of yogurt dispensers with a timid look on his face like he honestly can't decide what flavor he wants. Isn't that classic? The kid who feasted on Joel, chewed him up and spit him out, can't make up his mind between strawberry banana and rum raisin. Too bad they don't have poison. He must feel me glaring at him because he glances up and catches my eye. He looks right through me at first, which is insulting enough. And then he does something so horrible that I can barely believe it, even from the likes of him. He casts me a shy smile. All the anger that's been building inside me since Joel left for Melton rises to the surface like magma. Before I have a chance to think about it and stop myself, I stalk over to Chase. I get right in his face and tell him, You've got some nerve grinning at me after what you did. You stay out of my way or you'll be sorry. I take my beautiful vanilla yogurt with chocolate sprinkles, dump it over his head, 
and sweep out of the store. My father's in conversation with one of the other dads and almost misses me storming past. Done so soon, he asks. Then he looks back inside and sees our family's arch enemy, dripping frozen yogurt and sprinkles all down his face, dabbing at himself with a soaked napkin in his one free hand. Cars around the corner, Dad mumbles, hurrying me away from heaven on ice. He's embarrassed, sure, but maybe also a little bit proud. And how do I feel? I thought there was nothing Chase could do to make me madder at him than I already am. Now I stand corrected. Every time I think about it, my blood boils a little bit hotter. After all the bad history that went down between him and Joel, I swear he looked at me like he'd never seen me before in his life, like he hadn't played a starring role in destroying my family. Thanks for listening. You can request Restart by Gordon Corman at mynpl.org or by calling the library at 507-645-6606. It's also available as an ebook and an e-audiobook on Libby. New First Chapter Friday recordings premiere Fridays at 12 p.m. on Facebook and YouTube.